Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to GearFest 2021. We have a special guest joining us. This is Nicole Rowe. It's great to see you. Hey, you too. Happy to be here. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you join us virtually via, via Zoom. So I uh, appreciate you yeah. taking the time. Of course. I'm just hanging out at home. Nice, <laughs> nice. So, uh, man, high-profile gigs. Panic at the Disco, <laughs> Miley Cyrus, and tons of other stuff you have going on. And, and uh, we have to uh, shout out uh, EBS for, uh, for bringing you to GearFest this year. Yeah, yeah. Super happy they connected us. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you, you got into the bass. You started playing at 17, right? Yeah, yeah. I started kind of kind of late. Um, I was really into just, you know, I was into singing and playing lots of different instruments. And uh, bass just wasn't really in my my world. I, I didn't really realize that all the music I was into at the time was bass oriented. And that's why I liked it until I just kind of, you know, played someone else's bass um, and just kind of fell in love with it. And I felt like it was the one thing that I picked up where I was like, oh, I'm actually kind of kind of naturally good at this in a way. You know, I had like a little bit of groove and uh, just a different touch for it. And uh, yeah. And then I got my own. Right. Well, Yamaha, yeah. <laughs> right, nice. So did you start out playing jazz right away or were you playing other styles no. of music initially? So um, I actually came up playing, so I grew up in Fresno. So that whole world, I didn't play in school. Um, I just got really into like, you know, uh, like some ska music, more, you know, I like started playing like sublime things kind of like that. And um, then very quickly discovered because of bass, I got really into like funk music and R&B and soul and stuff like that. So jazz isn't um, necessarily what my background is, but it's incorporated into a lot of the uh, music that I'm playing now. I see. Right. Yeah. yeah. So how did you uh, how did you start landing gigs and and uh, progress toward the the Miley Cyrus gig? I I was playing a gig in Vegas um, like four nights a week, and I decided I just couldn't do it anymore, and I quit. And the next day I got called for an audition and weirdly enough, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. And I was in LA for it and I did the audition and I got a tour with a small artist. And then from there, it just sort of, um, I realized that like the touring circle is very tight knit. You know, once you start touring, it just kind of, your name gets tossed around and that's exactly what happened. And I just started, I played with Troy Sivan after that. And then from there, a connection to Miley Cyrus happened and then from their offender endorsement, which then led to the connection to panic. Um, so very weird domino effect, yeah. Right, right. That's kind of the way that it works, though. One thing kind of yeah. leads to another, and exactly. a lot of it is yeah. connections and building on, on your past successes, which is which is awesome. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about the diff the two different worlds, because in one case, you're mm -hmm. working more as a side person playing along with the, uh, the an, an artist, yeah. and, but yeah. with panic, you're part of the band. Tell us yeah. about how that's different for you. That's actually, I love that question because it's a really big uh, dramatic change. It took me a minute to get used to it. So with somebody like Miley, for example, um, your creative element is, you know, it's there because you come in to play the instrument that somebody needs you to provide, you know, the skill for. So you do what you know suits the music, right? Um, but as far as live shows go, you know, we are given wardrobe. We are, you know, we have our place and we stay there, which you know, is most shows. Now you see the band is kind of just either in the back or even like behind a huge screen where you don't even see them. Um, and yeah, you're just, you know, eyes on the MD or the artist. And it's very, very much like, okay, where are we going now? Whereas with Panic, um, you know, when I showed up, I the audition told me a lot because I, I came in and I started playing the songs with a pick. And Brendan, I think it was Brendan looked at me and he was like, you don't play bass with a pick. I've seen your Instagram videos. And I was like, yeah, but your all your music <laughs> it was like that style and uh he was like no I, I want you to play how you play like this is not what you're you know this is not the normal thing so um and you know there's the musical taste where i get to come in and bring my own sound in and make my own musical choices and i can have a little bit more freedom with improv and um and then there's also the stage presence element where if you know i, I love to make this joke like if i walk a little bit further ahead of Brendan on the stage, I'm not going to get fired. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot more, a lot more fun and freedom in that, in that way. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So even though they gave you, when you came into panic, all the, this freedom to, uh, to do yeah. what you want, did you still feel that you should be recreating the bass lines and the tones or how did you approach that? So I, um, I kind of approached it thinking about, um, 
how I like to experience a concert. You know, if I'm, you know, in the front row at a show, I'm probably really excited and I'm obsessed with the music and I know every little detail about, you know, the lyrics, the sounds, the lines, the tones, everything. So I wanted to, while, you know, creating my own sound, bringing my own element into it, um, I wanted to add a little bit of that into it, right? So I kept the bass lines fairly the same, um, except for, uh, you know, expressing around something, maybe doing like a fill or building with the drummer, you know, because there are some live elements that are different than the albums. Um, and then also, you know, taking my preferred tone, which is more of like a warm, uh, more boomy low end. And then I would just kind of add some drive or fuzz on top of it, bring some clarity out um, to get more of that like rock sound into it. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, when you were, when you were talking about getting started on bass that you already kind of came into it with mm -hmm. a feel for the groove and, and for feel. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about what groove means to you. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's funny. I like hate hearing that I even said that about myself. I don't like talking about myself like that. But uh, so when I realized that, you know, what I understood to be my groove was part such a big part of my playing. I was uh, just really into things with heavy bass lines where maybe that's the prominent feature in the song, right? And um, realizing that when I'd play with drummers, uh, we could kind of lock into this placement of maybe, you know, he's holding down a groove and, you know, one spot here and I'm maybe pulling back on him, right? And all the, the effects that you can have on the music with that push and that pull. Um, so, you know, if I want it to be drivey and aggressive, I'll push on him. And if I want it to be slow and sultry and groovy, I'll pull back. You know, it just kind of depends on the genre. And so all the things that come on top of just playing groove, right? Um, improvising or, you know, taking a lick or something like that, you know, it's all very important. But I realized very quickly that the, the foundation of bass, you know, where it comes from, it's not all that. It's just, it's very simple thinking about bright bass. Um, very solid and l like linking up with a you know a kick drum yeah Is that's, so that's what you that's tend what to key off to of as uh, when yeah you're, when you're yeah going well that's how yeah that's how it should start right listening to what everyone else is doing and what the song demands and uh hearing the kick and what what the groove is doing because you're blending the two together all the melodic instruments and the drums you know right right yeah so you also play upright bass and synth bass as well how, yeah. do the, how do the three of those inform one another? The electric bass, upright bass, and synth bass? Yeah, so um, the upright bass is definitely, um, it's more of a, I don't want to say more of a soulful experience for me, but the acoustics of it are much more intense. Um, so the way I approach it is a little bit more delicate, uh, whereas the synth is just kind of like heavy hitting funk world for me. <laughs> um heavy lines lots of lots of low end um i realized very quickly that i needed to incorporate synth in my life it's uh it's a, a lot of demand now for bass players who can do all three yeah right so yeah um they they're they're more light in my experience yeah mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Well, let's shift back to the, the focus here, which is electric bass and EBS pedals. And I know they're a mm -hmm. big part of creating the tones that you use. Can you yeah. tell us a little bit about how you approach using pedals? Yeah. So I'm actually, uh, when I first started bass, I was like one of those people who was like four string, pure sound, no effects, right? You know, I was like dead set on that. Um, and it took me a really long time to kind of be like, okay, I'll throw some pedals in, you know. And that came with playing backing up artists who needed a specific sound, you know? So um, I am one of those people, I, I like to roll it on lightly, right? And um, just kind of let it be a delicate blanket that kicks in that you you almost just feel it rather than like hear the dramatic effects, right? Except for maybe like, you know, a distortion or drive or something like that. Um, and yeah, I like to be very simplistic. Mm -hmm. With my taste for pedals, yeah. Right. Would you? Uh, could I ask you to demonstrate a few sounds for us and and uh, yeah. hear the kind of things that you do? Of course. Let me give you a little. Okay. So as you can see, yeah, um, EBS is a big part of my life. <laughs> um, so uh, octave, drive, chorus, envelope filter, uh, my verb, and my phaser. So the chorus, the phaser, and the verb 
I kind of intermix depending on it's it's more for like you know if I'm improvising or doing something uh, that I want to fill the room and have people kind of have more of a delicate experience um you know or like a thundercat type thing <laughs> right um the envelope filter i just really just use for funk i don't get to use it super often because it is a a slap in the face in a, in a really good way the octave i love using for you know heavy rock like a big breakdown of a song or you know maybe trying to get a little synthy if i'm playing like my low you know my low areas and then the drive is this is actually i use this a lot with panic that's um just kind of brightens up gives me more of that rock sound. So actually, let me show you that one first. So that was, um, that's Girls, Girls, Boys. That's a panic tune. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what I use that for. A lot of just the grungy stuff right uh let's see let's throw in a little bit of the more light sultry stuff so here's my verb and my phaser to actually here let me give you one at a time huh so let's do phaser first add some verb on there this is fun i really love those two together they just kind of build on each other um yeah, do you mind if i do that it huh? makes for a real liquid kind of a smooth it really does which is what i love really sings. yeah <laughs> i really love the liquid um let me see so here's i'll play a little bit of my original tune with the chorus pedal let's see here so chorus pedal is really fun it it's kind of the more edgy sultry thing that i like to do you know if it's something a little bit more um solo <laughs> yeah so that one's fun also with the verb right the verb does so much to everything i love it yeah right right um let's see uh okay so we've got the uh, envelope filter and the octave so these are probably the more dramatic ones um that sound guys hate so <laughs> so we love using them <laughs> let's see so um let me give you like uh actually let me give you the envelope filter first here we go <laughs> <laughs> so cool i love it so much right. um and then octabase all right so this one sometimes i'll cheat and use the low end but that's not really what it's intended for right so if we go kind of high let's see here 
It really shines up here in the high range. that up for you a little bit. I don't know what you guys are hearing, but it's not coming through super hot for me. Yeah, right. There we go. So I actually keep this one set super low, the, the octobase. Um, it really doesn't need a lot. If you kick the octave all the way up, it's like, boom, it's like way loud. So I'm gonna give you the same kind of like I was doing earlier. line that goes low brutal right? right way way too hot yeah so i kind of like to keep it in like the more high range stuff uh, me. just like a cool line kind of satisfies the synth Right. That people want a little bit when you don't have the synth, right? When you're bleeding into that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. And yeah, also, so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say it also just thickens the tone up. Having it really does. Having blow, it, it, uh, it's almost like a subharmonic that, that rides along yes, with the Yes, exactly. The yeah. Yeah, you add, like, <laughs> you, add, you add the, I'm, I'm just trying to sell everybody this verb right now. I'm just in <laughs> love with it so much. <laughs> oh. Yeah, octa bass right. and verb. Beautiful. So good. Yeah. yeah. So one of the challenges with using effects with bass, and uh, of course the EBS pedals are designed specifically for bass, so so not, yeah. not so much of a thing is is that yeah. sometimes when you step on effects, you can drop the bottom end out a little mm -hmm. bit if you're if you're not 100%. careful with it. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you manage that? Yeah. So actually, that that was a learning curve. I think for everybody shopping for pedals is a learning curve. You buy a bunch of stuff that sits in your closet, like I have. Um, and sometimes you get, you know, either the low end just disappearing, right? So then you almost sound, you kind of have to battle sounding like like the guitarist a little bit. You know, if you're using anything that's bright, um, you're going to pop a little too much. And then you lose, you lose like the sensation of vibration in your stomach, you know, if you're like a viewer or listener. Um, so EBS has kind of gotten around that. Everything I've ever gotten from them is clean. And sometimes the the like real middle ground of that is some companies sell stuff that um you'll plug into it and you'll play through it and it it almost it hangs onto the bass for a second and then it drops it and then you can hear it kick in and out uh so you know technology is is tough we're getting there um but yeah that's that might be why i'm so leaning into them so much ebs has really conquered it <laughs> right 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 that's yeah. awesome yeah. We really appreciate you sharing some of those tones and the way you're using the pedals and things. That's, that's awesome. Appreciate it's that. Fun. So tell us what do you have, what's going on? What's coming up for you uh, in the future? Mm. So um, because of the friggin' backlog of touring, right? Everybody who's supposed to go on tour in 2020 is now doing it right now. Um, we are relaxing as far as panic goes. We're, you know, chilling. Uh, I, can't, I can't really give you any specific details because it's all super secret. But right. um, yeah, we are staying local for now um taking care of some other things and then for me personally i am doing a bunch of uh like just kind of local shows which has been really fun uh you know like late nights people are you know just really it's like roaring 20s everybody's trying to get out and see some live music and hang and i'm um, doing a lot of that and then there's you know session stuff from home uh which has gotten really you know during the quarantine that was mostly what everybody was doing was writing, recording, doing everything virtually. So a lot of this, you know, right? Um, yeah. So that's what's kind of occupying my time. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. It sounds like you're staying busy, and and of course, the, yeah. like you said, touring is open back up again. So I'm sure we'll see you out on the road soon. Yes. 
Yeah, if it were up to me, I'd be gone. I'd be out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes. But it's not so. <laughs> it's going to happen, though. It's going to happen. It will. Yeah. <laughs> Absorb the time at home. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Nicole, thanks so much for taking time for us today. It's been a, a real of pleasure course. to talk to you, yeah. and we appreciate you sharing all your knowledge and your experience on all, all this uh, base stuff. Base, uh, yeah, right? <laughs> base nonsense. That's yes. what we live for. <laughs> yeah. And I hope, I hope we can have you visit us here at Sweetwater soon. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. Super yeah. down for that. Right. We'll mm-hmm. make that happen. Cool. All right. Thanks again. Please take care. <laughs> thank you. You too. All right. And thank you for joining me. We had Nicole Rowe talking with us about base and EBS pedals. Enjoy the rest of Gear Fest.